and welcome to the 2021 Tournament of Champions Women's Leadership Program. I'm Will Carlin, and I will be your host throughout today. But before we get too far, we wanted to remind everyone of the excitement of the Tournament of Champions Tournament and of our past awards winner. Welcome again to the 2021 Tournament of Champions Women's Leadership Program. Again, I'm Will Carlin, and we are thrilled to be continuing this program despite COVID not allowing us to hold the Tournament of Champions this year. And I want to take a moment to quickly introduce you to the committee that has worked so hard to pull this off. They're just going to wave now, but you'll hear from each of them as we go along. First, the, of Cham the chairman of the Terminator of Champions and the CEO of Squash Engine, John Nimick. John, will you wave? Second, the longtime chair of the Women's Leadership Program and one of the people enormously responsible for ensuring equal prize money on both the men's and women's tour, and the woman who's really made this event this year happen. Please say hi to Ashley Bernard. Ashley, will you wave? Hi. Third, the director of operations at Squash Engine and the glue that often holds really everything together, Melissa Wynn Stanley, the longtime partner of John, and her daughter, Jess Wynn Stanley, who's the co-chair of the Women's Leadership Program, who will take over the entire thing in the next year or two. As I said, we'll hear a little bit from each of them a little bit later, but I also want to remind you that if you have any questions for our eventual award winners, we would love to hear from you today, and you have the chance to do that. You just have to type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom, and they will get relayed on to somebody who will ask them of me, and I will relay them on to the athletes themselves as we get to that part of the program. But for now, what we'd like to do is show you a quick video about the PSA Foundation. That is the organization who is our beneficiary this year, and I think you're going to love their message. the court we are one for lena wa kita jaga kita we are one i love that the top players want to help up and coming players it's really an amazing thing about our sport and today we're lucky enough to have one of the players who came up with the idea to explain how it happened 
And to introduce him, I would like to welcome back Jess Wynn Stanley. Thanks, Will. Jess. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, for me, it really just feels like we're coming together as a community, which means so much right now. This year has obviously been a year unlike no other, and community just has a whole new meaning. That is why I was so excited that this year we will be honoring a team for the awards and in turn, we'll be supporting our professional squash community. For me, I grew up as a kid helping my mom out at pro squash tournaments. And I thought year after year that these pro squash players were the coolest people that I had ever come across. They were and they are just so fun, funny, kind, so intelligent, inclusive, and most of all driven by their absolute love for this sport. The person that I'm introducing today epitomizes those character traits to the T. Saurabh Bosal has spent the last better part of the decade actually at the top 20 within the world top 20 ranking. And he has together with Adriana Olaya at the PSA Foundation created the We Are One Fund. Unfortunately, Saurabh is in India and he's unable to join us today. However, he's created a video to tell us more about the We Are One Fund. Thank you and enjoy. So I think at the beginning of the lockdown, almost a year back now in March, um, you know, I was just sitting in India and reading so many stories uh, about so many different people from all walks of life uh, struggling really badly. And, you know, I realized that uh, for all the you know complaints we make, we actually live a very privileged, uh, privileged life. And uh, it just so happened that I was on a call with Adriana and she mentioned to me that uh, you know, there are some players who had gone for some satellite events or, you know, smaller events to different countries and they were stranded uh, and couldn't make their way back. So, you know, it, it was running in my head that I wanted to help people uh, at this time in, in some way that I could. And I just couldn't find the right um, outlet or the right process to do it. And uh, then this conversation with Adriana happened and I was like, you know, this is this is what I should try and, and achieve to try and help uh, the players who are part of my family, the part of, you know, what I've grown up with. Uh, I know a lot of the players I probably don't know lower down in the rankings, but they're all part of this brilliant squash family. And that's when I realized that, you know, there's something that we as uh, being one of the top players in the world, along with everyone else who's in the top 10, top 20, we have a responsibility to this sport to, to grow the sport, not just at the top end, but also to help uh, people coming up through the ranks. And I think the first thing we need to realize is that again, you know, as top players, we're very privileged. You know, we are the ones who've managed to play some sort of uh, competition over the last six to seven months. Uh, the players lower down have been struggling to, you know, play PSA events. Uh, a lot of clubs have been shut down in different countries. Leagues have been abandoned for now. Uh, so, you know, the revenue sources for a lot of the players has dried up uh, to unimaginable levels. And uh, you, the We Are One Fund uh, is helping players in such, uh, you know, circumstances to, to tide by this time so that we can come back uh, as a stronger tour uh, when all this blows over. And uh, we're a lot stronger and a more robust tour going forward. Uh, and, you know, we can all be proud of what we've achieved, uh, not just on a, on a financial standpoint, but also from a, from a moral and a, and a family togetherness standpoint. And I think that's very, very important because uh, keeping that family togetherness as part of our sport is what makes our sport it, what it is. And I'm so, so happy that, uh, you know, we've managed to, to do what we've done uh, over the last year. And credit for that goes to every single member and stakeholder of our brilliant, brilliant squash fraternity uh, that we're all so proud to be part of. I think you all can see why Saurav is one of the most popular players on the tour and one of the most respected players on tour as well. And for those of you who might not know the Adriana that Saurav referred to, uh, Jess did mention her also when she was introducing Saurav. Her, her name is Adriana Olaya and she's the manager of the PSA Foundation. And she's always here during the Tournament of Champions. She travels all over the world to the tournaments. And if you don't know her, you should. 
she's amazing, but she and Sara really get a huge amount of credit for all the work they've done. And now we are moving on to our keynote speaker. And to introduce our keynote speaker, I would wel like to welcome back Ashley Bernard, who, as I mentioned before, has been the guiding light of this event since its inception. Ashley. Thank you, Will. And thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I'm so glad that we've rallied to be together, but apart. And it's so hard to believe that this is the eighth uh, annual Tournament of Champions Women's Leadership Program. We have a great program today. And I just wanna say an added thanks to Adriana Olaya and um, her co-worker, Jordan Jeffries at the PSA Foundation and to Will Carlin, our MC and executive producer because they have just done an amazing job behind the scenes to make this all happen. It's been a passion and a mission to support and highlight female athletes and women who lead on and off the court. And when communities, governments, businesses, and even sports invest in women and girls, the research shows that the rising tide lifts all of the boats. And the Professional Squash Association has just been um, so fantastic um, in regards to this. And by investing in and believing in the women's tour and providing equal prize money at our top events, the entire tour has grown and benefited. And revenues, social media interaction, and the overall prize money for both the men and the women have all increased. And this is really a team effort. And I am so proud to be uh, part of this team with you all. It is a pleasure and an honor to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Jennifer Cooper from UN Women. For over 20 years, Jennifer has been advocating for gender equality around the world. More recently, she has been the UN Women Lead on partnerships with global sports organizations, such as the Inter International Olympic Committee and FIFA, harnessing the massive power of sport to promote opportunities for women and girls in and through sport. She is also the lead on UN Women's Sport for Gender Equality, uh, Generation Equality, which you'll hear more about from her in a minute. Um, her resume is really the gold standard uh, for people advocating for women and girls. However, there is an equally important detail that you need to know about Jennifer, and that is that she is an athlete. She swam in high school and in college, and don't tell anybody at the UN, but her most favorite job of all time was being a swim coach. Um, so she really gets our program and our mission, not only as an advocate, but also as an athlete. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Cooper. Wow, thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you to all of the members of the committee. I'm so honored to be here um, to this year's Women Leadership Awards program, representing you and women which is the United Nations organization that is mandated to deliver for women and girls around the planet. So here we are uh, still in a virtual world, but with so much hope as we're beginning to emerge finally from this pandemic, which took such a heavy toll on the world of sports. It's, so, it's so wonderful to see the We Are One Fund stepping up to support players during the pandemic. But I also have to say that the pandemic also disproportionately impacted women across the world. And according to the World Economic Forum, Closing the gender, the global gender gap has just increased by a generation from 99.5 years to 135.6 years. So we really have our work cut out for us uh, as we try to build back better. And in March of 2020, literally just as the World Health Organization declared the global pandemic, UN Women was gearing up to celebrate a landmark achievement. And this is the, that was the 25th anniversary of something called the Beijing Platform for Action. You might recall the words of Hillary Clinton, who famously declared in Beijing in 1995, human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. And she was referring to the Beijing platform, which is the most comprehensive and transformative global agenda for the achievement of gender equality in history. And this international agreement is still relevant today and perhaps more today now than ever. 
And so in UN Women, we wanted to expand awareness and action to address the unfinished business of Beijing, especially among those who might not have heard about it or not know about it. So I worked closely with the International Olympic Committee to come up with something called the Sport for Generation Equality Principles, which are based on the Beijing platform. And the, the, um, the offer is to engage the members of the sport ecosystem as allies, and also to reach young people with this message through the power of sport. And I have to thank the Professional Squash Association for being the first professional sport to sign on to the Sport for Generation Equality principles. And that was on International Women's Day in 2020. But more importantly, squash is turning those commitments into action through instituting equal prize money and even in some tournaments awarding more prize money to women and men. I believe it is the only sport that can make such a claim. And as Ashley said, this is actually helping to grow the sport overall. So it's not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. And squash also promotes women's leadership, which is why we're here today. And this is the first of the six sport for generation equality principles that also deal with things like investment, economic opportunities, ending violence against women and girls in and through sport and providing opportunities for girl child to play. So the leadership piece is deliberate. And that is because if women are at the decision-making table, policy is going to be more equitable. And if women are on the court and visible, these powerful role models can inspire others. But we also know that women and girls who play sport become leaders as a result of playing sport. Girls who play learn resilience, fair play, and have increased self-esteem. And these are values that continue to pay dividends throughout life. In fact, in the United States, 96% of women in the C-suite in corporate America played sports in high school or college. So sport can be a driver of gender equality both on and off the field of play. And finally, I just want to acknowledge the foundation. These principles are very much aligned to those of you and women, empowering women and children through squash, promoting equal pay and opportunities, and advocating for equal exposure and prize money. So I encourage all of you who are participating today to continue to show your support for the fantastic mission of the foundation and for the sport of squash. And with partners like you doing your part, we can achieve gender equality and the promise of Beijing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Wow, uh, that's really inspirational. And I love that statistic about 90 plus percentage of uh, women who are CEOs have played a sport. Doesn't surprise me, but it's really impressive. Thank you so much for being here today and for sharing what you do with all of us. Now, before I get to the 1980 women's team, I thought what I might do is share with you some details about their trip and their, their episode. So a survey was taken a few years ago that asked 300 sports writers one question. What's the biggest upset in the history of sports? Some people answered Buster Douglas knocking out Mike Tyson. Other people said it was when Joe Namath led the Jets to the Super Bowl. Some people said it was when Jim Valvano led NC State to the NCAA title. And some New England fans said it was losing to the Giants and not just the damn game but that stupid catch against the helmet, preventing a perfect season. But the most answered that the biggest upset that ever happened in sports by the sports writers was when some hockey team beat another hockey team in an Olympic moment called the miracle on ice. Now, something you may have noticed about all these biggest upsets was that none of them included women. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about a true story and perhaps partly because it's about young women, it's a story that's mostly unknown. It starts in 1980, the same year as the Miracle on Ice and squash in the US is starting to boom. In fact, there are 87 public squash courts in New York City alone. In 2021, that number will be a mere 16. League play is at an all time high and there are national tournament sponsors like in Silco and Boodle's Gin. And over at the Heights Casino in Brooklyn, a husband and wife coaching team have created a junior squash powerhouse. The coaches of course are Fred and Carol Weimuller. And last year, 1979, they took a group of boys and girls to Australia to compete internationally. So when they heard that the first ever World Junior Championships was gonna be held this year, 1980 in Kungla, Kungal, Sweden, they knew they had to send a team. 
Unable to secure funding from the USSRA, Carol decides to appeal to individuals and parents. She handpicks five of the top young women in the United States and works until the last minute trying to garner more sponsors and support. The team is anchored by two Heights Casino students, US junior champion Alicia McConnell and her sister Patrice. But Carol also reaches out to two of the top players from Philadelphia, Karen Kelso and Kat Castle, and one from Connecticut, Diana Staley. Now make no mistake, this is a shoestring affair to be sure. Manta did donate some rackets and bags and Dunlop has given them four dozen balls. But on the plane, the team sews USA letters onto their Adidas warmups and unable to afford the tournament hotel, each of the players billets with locals. Well, first up is the individual title, six matches played over four days. And while all five members of the team play well in spurts, Alicia makes it to the final without losing a game. Her opponent is Finland's top junior, who already is Finland's women's national champion, Katja Sauerwald. Alicia hits Katja with a hard serve on one of the first few points and uses that momentum to roll to a love game. And although Katja does something no one else has been able to do by winning the second game, Alicia holds off the finish challenge to become the first ever junior women's world champion. It's an amazing feat. The rest of the team is inspired by hearing the US national anthem and seeing Alicia raise her arms. And it's a good thing they are because the team championships start tomorrow. Now, two things you need to know before the team championships begin. The first is that before Sweden, the only tournaments the US players had ever played were hardball tournaments. Smaller courts, faster balls, completely different strategy. And the second is that the team was just beginning to realize that they could rely on each other. And that's put to the test in the very first match where the opponent is none other than Finland. And right away, the magnitude of what Alicia has just accomplished, accomplished hits home as Katya gets revenge and takes out Alicia three love. That means that both Kat and Karen have to come through. Kat routes her opponent three love while Karen looks a little bit outclassed in her match. She drops the first game 9-1 and is down big in the second before drawing inspiration from her teammates. She mounts an incredible comeback and takes the second game 9-6, overcomes her nerves and rides the momentum to a four game victory. The US moves on. In the next match against Scotland, Alicia wins, but Karen loses, so the match comes down to Kat. Cat's down 2-1 when she slams on the brakes and takes the last two games and the match. The semifinals is against Sweden, and this time Cat only loses one point, and the team match again comes down to Alicia, who fights off a third game challenge, wins her match, and puts the Miracle U.S. team into the final. In the finals, they face top-seeded Ireland, who are heavily favored. Carol is telepathically telling her three players to be alert right from the start. And guess what? They're alert right from the start. In fact, all three players win the first game of their matches, but Kat and Karen drop the next two and Alicia drops a third. That means all three matches are headed to the fourth game. Karen loses, Alicia wins, and Kat heads to the fifth. So just to make it clear, the match is all square, one to one in matches and two to two in the decider. But Kat loves this team thing. In fact, she hasn't lost a team match yet and she doesn't in the finals. She pulls it out and gives the US team the first ever World Junior Team Championship. The national anthem is played, medals are bestowed and Alicia dances the first dance with the boys junior champion. At the airport going home in a bizarre coincidence, they run into Hashim Khan and take pictures. And when they get home, supporter Larry Sconzo celebrates the victory with the team. Now each member of the team goes on to play number one or number two in college and they compete against each other often. Alicia goes on to become arguably the best women's hardball player of all time 
even playing a memorable exhibition against Hashem Khan. So was this upset bigger than the US hockey win over Russia that very same year? Well, let me make this comparison. If that Olympic hockey team had been the US men's field hockey team that beat the Russian ice hockey team, it might be comparable. Am I being serious? You bet I am. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I would like to introduce our award presenter and I'm going to welcome back the man who's going to introduce him to you. He's the man who makes the entire tournament of champions happen. Please welcome again, John Nimick. Thank you very much, Will. Appropriately for our celebration today, Ned Edwards graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1980, right at the start of a boom in the popularity for squash. He enjoyed an outstanding professional career, earning the number two ranking for six years in our North American circuit, and he led five U.S. teams to the world championships. He is a member of both the U.S. and the college halls of fame. But Ned's impact on our sport is not defined by those credentials. It is defined by his integrity, sportsmanship, fairness, and determination. He's been a commercial club manager. He's been a college coach. And now he is executive director of the brand new 20 court Arlen Specter US National Squash Center in Philadelphia, a role where he and other passionate advocates for our sport plan to usher in a new golden era for the game. He made a living beating me relentlessly on tour, but nonetheless, please welcome my lifelong dear friend, Ned Edwards. Thank you, John. And, and Will, what a wonderful way to describe the action in Sweden. I'm really so happy to be part of the Tournament of Champions Women's Leadership Program and to be part of honoring the 1980 junior women's team, the championship team. Diana and Kat and Patrice, Karen, Alicia, and, and Carol, Coach Carol, your accomplishments have stood the test of time for sure. Indeed, I think that they're exactly the type of accomplishments that coach and players dream of replicating. The victories you earned in Sweden in 1980 were remarkable. You were young players with very little competitive experience with a, a slow, soft, heavy ball on wider courts, on foreign turf. And what you show was a superb example really of, of what everyone looks for in athletes and, and human beings, which was uh, resilience and grit. It was terrific. Capturing the team championships and Alicia being crowned the individual championship was running the table at an international squash event. And, uh, that that news um, reverberated. But your performances were not a flash in the pan at all. When you came back home, the squash ecosystem was flourishing unbelievably in an unprecedented way. And your competitive drive and success was, was reflected throughout the women's game for sure, but really throughout the entire sport. League play and tournament play was flush with players from levels A through F. Uh, women and men made up lawyers and corporate league teams. And then all of that filtered up to the professional ranks where there was a committed band of women who, who were striving to find their, their moment on court with Alicia, who was dazzling spectators at all events with her athleticism, her power and her grace. It, it, was, a, it was a terrific time and the women's role throughout all of that range of, of active play and, and the commercial facilities that Will was referencing, it was very dynamic. But I'm, I'm so, so pleased to be part of congratulating this team. And again, Kat, Diana, Patrice, Karen, Alicia, and, and Carol. Um, what you did was an important symbol and it was not just about women's squash, it was about squash broadly. And what I think that we're also feeling today, led by Amanda and, and really the high powered members of Team USA, the women of Team USA, I think that we're all feeling that that movement is taking shape again today. And so congratulations 
champions of 1980. Your victory stays with the sport very proudly. Some amazing words, Ned, and I really love the way you echo, I think, what a lot of us felt at the time of how much their victory reverberated for all of us, um, and it just made a huge dent. I would finally like to welcome three of the players from that team who are with us today to come in and join Ned and me. Patrice McConnell, Cromwell, well, let's see, that's Cat uh, Castle Grant first, Polite Patrice McConnell, Cromwell and Alicia McConnell. There, was you, there we are, okay, all of us are here. So Ned, you get the honor of presenting the bowl and there actually is a bowl that I believe is in your possession. And if you can actually hold it up and present it to the team and team, I know this is gonna be hard, but if you can try not to drop it through Zoom, that would be wonderful. So Ned, present it to them. <laughs> and there we go. All right. Patrice, Alicia. To you, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please live on very happily. Thank you. Ned, thank you so much for your time and for your great words. And Alicia, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you. I believe you have some words you'd like to say on behalf of the team. And then I'm gonna come back and the four of us are gonna chat for a while. Yes, and first of all, just what an honor to accept on behalf of the team. I mean, that's the word I think that we all took away from that experience. What was amazing is, you know, individually you can do well, but when you're a team and you're focused on the experience and you're focused on supporting each other, and that's what we all really took away and got out of that uh, championship, win or lose, it was how much we supported each other and enjoyed the journey of the experience and so thank you again for this honor it, it's so amazing to watch i think i hope i'm speaking for all of us that just to see the pictures and i mean looking at our smiles and the energy that we had was just uh it was just really fun to look at and you know and with that again a big shout out you know john and ashley started the uh you know the tournament champions women's leadership program in 2014 focused on Really talking about women's leadership and focused on the women's game and, and they met the equity challenge in 2015. So thank you for all that you're doing to continue to promote uh, and support women in squash. And another takeaway from us as a team, which I think we all loved, is that how amazing it was we come back and we bump into Hashem Khan <laughs> and all of a sudden we felt like, you know, he was sort of that beginning of of a, of a whole squash move, movement of inclusivity. And then all of a sudden we do this wonderful thing. We bring back some hardware, these young teenagers. And what it almost brought this awareness of squash to the US, this other international game that people, we, nobody knew about it. And so it, it was just amazing to be on this ride where the, the journey of the US starting to realize there's this international game. And today, look where we are. I mean, the most prize money events are in the United States. People come from across the globe to the United States to coach, to play, and, and do many other things. So the States now is such a strong place for squash. And it's just what a privilege. We've all talked about the opportunity squash has given us. So again, never forget that, uh, that time that we had. And I'm just going to put out the sticker. That was our world champion sticker and the little, you know, the medal that uh, the, the individual medal. So again, honored and thank you for those uh, that joined in uh, the contributions go to the We Are One Fund and agree the PSA Foundation is doing great work. And thank you again, um, Will, uh, teammate at the Heights Casino as well. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for remembering that. I think one of the things that was so great about having you and Patrice as friends growing up was that I never had any qualms about losing to women because you two kicked my butt all the time. And uh, I was just used to it from a young age. I didn't think there was anything weird about it. It was like, they're good, they beat me. So there we go. Um, I wanna start off with some of the things, I, I'd be interested to know what you three feel about having traveled over to Sweden alone. In other words, without a men's or a men's coach or, or a boys team. 
And was that something that you, when you got there and you saw other countries had both, did you feel weird about that? Was it cool that you were there on your own? What was that experience like? Patrice, why don't we start with you? Uh, for me, I, I thought it was fantastic. We were there as a girls team and Carol took the lead to really suggest the idea. It was odd when we started playing that we didn't have a boys team there. And we certainly missed our, uh, our guy friends like you will. Um, at the same time, we were glad the US still allowed us to go even though there wasn't a boys team uh, going with us. And Kat, I read, I think I read somewhere, Kat, that you, I think it was you, thought that perhaps the entire New Zealand boys team was um, fairly attractive. And uh, so I, I'm wondering about after hours stuff. Was there any socializing? And it doesn't have to be between the boys and the girls, but was there stuff going on between teams? I mean, were you guys getting together or was it pretty much just Oh, no, we were extremely disciplined, well-trained. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't recall really hanging out with them. There was one New Zealand player in particular. I, I happen to remember his name, Doug Lovell. I don't know if he still exists, if he's still playing, but uh, no, I feel like when we went out socially, it was just the team itself. Um, we were pretty good, pretty good. We had a great well, time. The team did get a lot of attention. There were a lot of boys teams and only a few girls teams. So it was. Uh... The, ratio, the ratio was working in your favor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, well, you say you were pretty responsible, but I believe that there was some downtime where you guys may have taken a trip to a certain closed castle. Does one of you want to tell me about that? Cat, <laughs> Cat, I think you're being well, volunteered. I recall, for some reason, I recall it was kind of damp and rainy and we were bored and we wandered into town and we said, oh my goodness, there's a 13th century medieval castle here. This is pretty cool for such a small town. But it said closed for the season, basically keep out. But somehow we managed to climb the walls and get in. And we thought we were gonna see some amazing scene of something. And it ended up, I, I recall, just kind of grass and a stone wall. I, I don't know, Alicia, do you remember? All that effort really <laughs> didn't pay off, yeah, but it was I, fun, I guess, just to get in. It was sort of like a team building to get in and out <laughs> of the castle. And it was actually snowy and um, I thought it was a blast. It was sort of like a little obstacle course in there. So, yeah. I, I love the fact that you say, you know, a 13th century castle was intriguing to these, you know, 17 year old girls. Like, I, I love that about you. I think it's fantastic. How aware were you three that Carol was your coach, was keeping a diary of the event and sort of really? I think she was even relaying stuff back home. I know she was to Fred, but I think maybe to other people as well. Did you guys know that was going on? And were you, did you want to sneak a peek at what she was saying or what was going on there? I think Carol was incredibly detailed in planning. I mean, she did amazing behind the scenes work and I don't think she really shared as much as she was really doing on our behalf. Uh, the funniest part for me was reading the diary later and one of my matches where I lost, she's like, well, and Patrice cried. <laughs> she she uh, felt for me at that time. That's very sweet. Well, Carol was uh, nothing if not empathetic. <laughs> Kat, you know, when Carol obviously had a special relationship with both Patrice and Alicia because she was their teacher from a young age, how did, you and Diana and Karen sort of react to that. Was it was it was Carol so equally attentive that it didn't matter, or were you aware that she was sort of, you know, the lifelong coach of Alicia and Patrice? How did that dynamic play out? Um, I didn't. I don't think I realized she was a lifelong coach, but it really didn't matter. Um, 
she was incredibly accepting of all of us. Like um, Patrice said, very detail oriented, um, was a mother really at times. Um, I felt extremely comfortable being around her. And um, she was a woman of wisdom when it came down to our matches. I mean, you really, it wasn't just all about playing for the team. It was playing for Carol and winning for Carol. And uh, it truly was an incredible experience. And I thank her every day for taking us over there, leading us and um, thankfully coming out with a wonderful victory. She was a wonderful person. She is a wonderful person, so. Yeah, she, she still is for sure. Um, yes. I've seen that there have been some questions that have been coming in. I still have a bunch more, but why don't I take a pause and ask Jess Wynn Stanley if uh, any questions have come in from the crowd that we might like to ask. Sure, the first one is from Gail Ramsey. Gail, thank you for your question. What did each of you take away from this amazing team experience? Why don't we start with Alicia first? Well, a, a big takeaway, uh, certainly in hindsight, is the biggest thing in life is that you, when you have an experience, like a successful experience like that, it's, it's the shared experience that makes it better than an individual experience. I think the team event and sharing the win and supporting each other, it was amazing. Patrice? I think that first it was really eye-opening. I mean, we spent most of our time in Brooklyn or near Brooklyn, and then here we are in Sweden. Um, so that was incredible. And I think the other thing that Carol really uh, emphasized is we were total underdogs. We had nothing to lose. Just put your full heart in it. And man, did that pay off. She just uh, showed us that there are really no, no boundaries. And Kat? I think all of us took away a lot of pride um, that said, knowing that we were the underdogs and it made it easier probably for me as a player because I'm like, well, we have nothing to lose. Give it all you've got. Um, so when we did succeed and play well and come out with this amazing victory, it just meant that much more. Um, it, it just, it was a wonderful time and wonderful to bring that home, so. Thank you, Gail, for that question. Jess, are there some others? Yes, the next one is directed to you, Kat. Um, it comes from Olivia Fichter, who from my understanding, she's telling me through text that you are a legend. She's from my hometown. Um, uh -huh. And the question is, you still play competitively, and do you carry the fact that you're world champion in your mind or not at all? How many of your opponents know today that you were known as a world force in the squash world 40 years ago? First of all, Olivia, thank you. And you're amazing. And looking forward to watching your career in the future. Um, absolutely not. <laughs> I do not uh, carry the world championship with me when I go on court. Um, I'm just extremely happy to be healthy, to be able to compete. I love the game and that's why I still play. Um, do most of the people know about the championship? Um, at first, no, but um, Jim Zug went, uh, wrote that wonderful article about the team not long ago. Um, I think it opened up some awareness as to what happened over in Kungav. Um, but that said, I, I, uh, I just go in and have fun and I love to compete. You know, uh, before we go back to Jess for some other questions, Kat, I just you know, you are a wonderful doubles player um, and you married a wonderful doubles player. And I can't help wondering if you also won all your team matches at this thing. And I, I wonder if there's something that happened there that you sort of, you realize that you really love being part of a team and, you know, you're a great singles player, but you're an amazing doubles player. And I wonder if there's something there. Um, well, it's interesting you say that because I did compete in tennis and squash individually for a long time. And, uh, but I also played team sports in high school and college. And although I loved playing single squash um, as an individual and a junior and then in college, I always looked forward to going back to those team sports. 
i.e. field hockey and lacrosse. It was kind of a balancing for me. Um, I always loved playing for people and with people. Um, probably a better team player than an individual player. Um, maybe didn't have enough confidence. Probably could have used a sports psychologist um, when I was a junior, but uh, I think felt more secure playing with a team as I did in my other sports. Um, so, and still do, you know, I, I enjoy it. I love playing with my partner, Lisa and Tutron. Uh, we're longtime um, friends since we were eight years old. And I love going to tournaments just to catch up with all other competitors and friends. That's the best part of it, the camaraderie, so. Yeah. So P Patrice and Alicia, I'd sort of like to turn that question a little bit on its side for the two of you. I mean, you obviously are sisters and you've been sisters your whole lives and you've been squash players for a huge part of your lives. And I wonder what that's like. Is it is it great having your sister share your passion or is it a pain in the butt that God, I'm doing something and I can't get away from her even now? Um, is it a little bit of both? Where are you guys on that spectrum? of Team McConnell. Well, well, I'll say it so Patrice doesn't have to, is uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm much better today being a team player, but for um, most of my life, probably still now, you know, it's so much about the winning, but really it should be about the journey. And I have to say my favorite nationals was when Patrice and I won the doubles nationals. And that's why I said that the team effort, it's so much more important to share something, win something together but I know that more now than I did then. So I think I was very, very focused on winning. And so I think I was a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and she's overemphasizing, but um, I mean, it's a great way to be close to your sibling. Alicia and I have done so many tournaments together in the US and outside of the US. And she's awfully generous. I mean, she could have picked anybody for a partner, not somebody who was a little bit further down the ladder. Um, and we were able to win some great titles, which was excellent. And I think she had to weather having me for a number of years when we come back from a junior nationals and I'd be like, oh, I came in 10 or whatever the number was. My parents would be like, oh, great, excellent. And then Alicia would be, oh, I got one and they, they had to be equal. Oh, great, mm. excellent. But Alicia was like, no, I won it. <laughs> so she was so generous to share. And I think we've met a ton of great people, great friends. And I think there's nothing better with that sport as my kids have enjoyed it. They've just built global networks. So as I watch pros, it's so cool to see them giving back and building friendships along the way. Well, I think let's take one more question from the audience and then we're, to believe it or not, just about out of time. So um, Jess, is there one more that you've uh, picked out there? There is, but if we could possibly fit in two, the oh, shorter okay. one is along the lines of what advice would any of you give to your junior self right now? That was along the lines from Rowena's question. And the second one is from Sarah Jane Perry. Sarah, SJ, thank you for being with us. Um, do you think women's sports success stories should be used more to show all women they can overcome the gender biases that still exist today? They're great questions. Anyone want to go first? Alicia, go ahead. I'll just up, jump in. Yeah, Sarah Jane, uh, definitely. I think there's a big push today. I know it was just Women's History Month, but I think more pressure needs to be put on all forms of media to, to talk about women's stories, you know, not just in sport, but on so many levels, you know? So yes, I think that's a, a big piece because in here in Ireland, we have a, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. So if you want to see those visuals in terms of, if I could tell something to my junior self, um, to enjoy the journey. I was so focused on the, you know, on getting somewhere on winning and, to learn to enjoy the whole process, win, lose, and everything else. So. I think one of the things I would say is, uh, you know, hearing our, our host panelists talk about how many women in C-suite have played sports, you know, more than 90%. 
it really sets you up to be a good team player and leader. Um, so I just would say to young people, just keep at it and not only work hard on the sport, but really get to know your teammates as well as your opponents, because you'll get to know them on other fields or courts as you get older in college. I guess my advice to myself um, nowadays would be continue to have fun, stay humbled, uh, work hard, um, and continue those friendships because squash is a lifelong sport. Those other team sports, you tend to not obviously get to play for the rest of your life. Um, but to me, it's really important to still have fun and enjoy it because um, that will carry you a long way. Um, in terms of the stories, absolutely. The more stories, the better for women's sports and all sports. Um, I think it's very important for the young kids to, to hear the successes and the accomplishments, um, sometimes the defeats and how women and young ladies have learned from these defeats in order to move forward and continue to be better and give back because that's what it's all about. It's giving back. The current USA would like you to know that they will be ready for you at the New Orleans Spectre Center to give you a run for your money. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, look, before we let the three of you go, I want to welcome back all the participants today. So the committee and Ned and everybody back, just so we can honor you and thank you for reminding all of us that, as you said, it's about the journey, but there's also something about just showing up. And I think that, you know, when you show up for an event, you never know what might happen. And I'd like all of us to just acknowledge, ladies and gentlemen, the 1980 Junior Women's World Champion Team. Thank you guys for being here. Um, John. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. John, before we go, I know that you have been uh, working hard behind the scenes on next year, um, 2022, and bringing the Tournament of Champions back to Grand Central Station. And because this is a so an event that's normally associated with the Tournament of Champions, I'm sure many people out there would love to just get an update from you on where we stand and what it looks like right now. Well, we are, we are full speed ahead, um, CDC, city and state regulations pending, obviously, but I think we're all encouraged at uh, what the live entertainment business uh, could get back to relatively shortly. Our dates for the 24th presentation of the TOC in Grand Central are January 13 to 21. Um, one of the most exciting things along the pathway here of women's success at the TOC has been watching the level of women's play, the quality of player, um, the fact that we are now filling the grandstands for women's sessions and women's play. Has, that has happened over the last five years. And it, you, when we talk about equality, it's one thing to have a, a wonderful sponsor in JP Morgan who made the commitment instantly to help us get to parity. But it's another when you see it actually happen on the ground, when you see people um, enthused, um, setting their schedules and turning up in Grand Central to watch their favorite woman play squash and compete. And we're thrilled with Amanda Sobey's recent success and her rise to number five. There's no question we'll all be on pins and needles wondering um, how far Amanda can go and what her performance will be like basically in her home tournament in New York. Um, it, Melissa, when Stanley and I always begin to collaborate on the tournament and we, we talk, we use this phrase that everybody uses, we're going to make it bigger and better. Well, squash has a real priority now on coming out of the pandemic, stronger, faster, more unified, more collaborative. We have to pull together here in the U S and globally, our sport has been set back over the last 13 months. We're just emerging and getting back on court. We feel an imperative to make the Tournament of Champions be out front to show the world how great squash is, what a wonderful lifelong game it is, to celebrate stories like the ones we've had today. 
Um, we will look forward to welcoming our, our honorees today at our Women's Leadership Luncheon for January uh, 2022. So we will, look, we will have another gathering and continue this great tradition. Um, but there is a lot that will be exciting about being back in Grand Central Terminal, uh, not the least of which is that we will put Squash's best foot forward. You mentioned her just a moment ago, but there's one more person I would like everyone to hear from. She doesn't often like being called out for recognition, but um, as I'm sure you can attest to, John, neither the Tournament of Champions nor our NetSuite Open in San Francisco nor this Women's Leadership Luncheon would happen without her. She's the Director of Operations at Squash Engine. She's the glue that holds everything together. I'm very pleased to also be able to say that she's a close friend, Melissa Wynn Stanley. Thank you, Will. It's been a great honor to be a part of this great sport for the many years that I've been in it. And I really appreciate having had this opportunity and having a passion that has carried me through um, for a long time. And I, I just really want to say also that this has um, been a great way to not only physically, to, to, not, to physically not be together for the Tournament of Champions Women's Leadership Program, but also it's been a great way to honor the U.S. Junior Women's Championship team, as well as to raise money for the much needed We Are One Fund. Thank you all for your support. We really appreciate it. And we hope that we see you in person next January at the 2022 Tournament of Champions. Thank you all so much for joining us today, both to recognize an amazing team and to helping support our pros through all the rankings. As I said earlier, one of the many things I love about our game is that we truly are a global community. Thank you all for being part of it. All of us can't wait to see you in person in New York in January. Be safe, be healthy. Cheers, everybody. See you soon.